too. You look fine too. Well, thanks. Appreciate that. Good morning. Thank you all for being here this morning. Hope everyone's had a good weekend so far. Uh, we're going to start with prayer requests. Uh, any updates to our bulletin that we need to be, uh, make ourselves aware of? Janie's back. She's better. Janie's doing better. That's good. Yeah, she's in the classroom. That's good. Good to hear. Um, Maybe y'all saw the email this morning. Uh, Lauren Shackelford went to the ER last night, and uh, he has a hernia, and uh, it wasn't uh, necessary for him to have an emergency surgery, uh, but it seems like that will be something that will happen in the near future. Um, so, uh, Susan, what time did y'all get home? Actually, I was home by just a little less than nine. Really? Okay. Good. Good deal. So, Susan. I started at first uh, sitting with them, and then Susan was my relief pitcher there, and I just called her from the bullpen. So, um, so good deal. I'm glad he's uh, at home, and just be praying for him as he rests up, and that he can um, that he can get uh, some relief from the pain that he's he's been going through. Any other updates? I also put on that email that Seth Emery, this is Cleo Emery's grandson, was moved back uh, towards where he lives in Idaho, uh, and he'll be up there where his family can take care of him. Rick, Rick keeps asking for prayers. Okay. Yeah, Rick Holden, is, he's having a tough time, isn't he, uh, with his, uh, the pain in his shoulder. So. And Don Hover's not doing good either. Don isn't? Okay. Yeah, so Don Hover, senior that we have here, uh, he's not doing very well at all, so we'll remember him in our prayers. Um, do you have any updates on how Pauletta's doing? You know, she gets to stay home all week this week. This week's her rest week? Yeah, week uh, last week. Last week. Okay, well, good. Anything on that, Rick Holden? Yeah, uh, they just said he's he's going through a lot of pain. I haven't heard on that that end. I know. Uh, yeah. They Jane still have schedules for the um, the weekends. So. Jane called and talked to his wife you know, a few days ago. Okay. Yeah. Who's in charge I don't know. They have a sign up sheet out there, so you might want to look at that. Flo. Flo, Flo's in charge of that. Okay, I don't see her this morning, but okay. Let's go ahead and pray. Dear God, our Father. I thank you for this morning uh, that we were able to, to rise and to uh, gather together and to remember all the good things that you've done for us. Uh, we pray, Lord, that our time of study and of worship will glorify your name and that we, by uh, being here, will grow in our worship and praise of you. Uh, you are worthy of our praise uh, because of all that you've done for us, not just in our lives, but ultimately what Jesus has done for us. Uh, by being that sacrifice for our sins and giving us hope and fellowship with you. We pray, Lord, for those who are sick and hurting. There's many, Lord, in our congregation and, and plenty that we know uh, who are struggling elsewhere. We pray you will be, especially right now, with Warren and the pain that he's dealing with, and we pray you will help him uh, through this trial and through an upcoming surgery. Uh, bless him, Lord, uh, during this time. We pray, Lord, that uh, you will be with Rick Holden as well as he's enduring a lot of pain. Uh, give him some relief, Lord. Uh, we pray, Lord, for Don Hover Sr. and his cancer treatment. We hate things aren't, aren't going too well for him, but we pray it will improve and that you'll give him comfort and his family comfort as well. We pray for Seth Emery as well as uh, he is uh, healing up after an accident. Uh, be with him and his family as he is on that road to recovery. Lord, there's many other that are going through a difficult time, uh, such as Ashley, uh, Wyatt, and Chloe's uh, 
mom, Alice Rogers, uh, Jessica Long, Hibbler's mom, uh, Lena Klein, uh, Hayden Helton, and uh, Pauletta Burns. And we lift them up, Lord, that you will bless them uh, this day. Help us, Lord, as we dig further into your word to understand <laughs> what you have been doing since the creation of the world and what you intend to do in us as your people. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, if you'll turn to the book of 1 Chronicles, that's where we'll start this morning. Uh, Y'all saw that my parents were here last week, and my dad said after the class, you should have warned us. You should have said, buckle in, strap in, because you're going to fly through this. And uh, I said, actually, I didn't get to cover all that I wanted to cover. So, uh, But that's just kind of the nature of this study, is that we're trying to, to look at a, a broad overview of what the Bible is, the the theme of the Bible and what God's trying to do among us uh, throughout the scriptures. And so, uh, so yeah, it might be fast at times, but uh, I think that's, um, that's good sometimes. Uh, I, I know there's, a, <laughs> there's kind of a difficulty sometimes with Bible classes that, okay, we're going to start the book of, of Matthew, and it takes about four years to get through the whole book. You know, sometimes we, we go uh, very detailed, but uh, this is... This is kind of the opposite. We're just trying to get a broad overview of what's, what's going on. And as we come to 1 Chronicles and 2 Chronicles, um, really these books are, um, are a lot of uh, repetition of what we've seen before, uh, especially in, in 2 Samuel and 1 and 2 Kings. Um, but it was, it was written at a different time. So 1 and 2 Kings, we note by the end of the book that it was written likely around the exile, maybe during the exile, because it actually talks about the Babylonians coming and taking the people of Judah and putting them into exile. Uh, when we find uh, the books of Chronicles, we find at the end of Chronicles that not only do they tell about uh, the exile, but it even tells about the end of the exile when they're brought back into the land. And so... Um, it's a little bit later, and, and because of that, I think we see a somewhat of a different take on that history. Not that there's any details that are different than what we find in First and Second Kings and Second Samuel, but that it has a different perspective. Um, really, what we saw throughout First uh, and Second Samuel and First and Second Kings was this desire on behalf of the people. Of Israel to have a king that will come and save them. And uh, we kind of get that hint too in the book of Judges. You know, they were doing what was right in their own eyes uh, and there was no king in the land. And then we have this book of Ruth that, that leads up to the lineage of, of David, the ultimate king. And so you've, you've got a lot of hopes as you go into 1st and 2nd Samuel and 1st and 2nd Kings, and then we get disappointed because these kings, they're human beings. And they fail. Even David, who is viewed as the ideal king that, that all of the, the good kings are, are measured up to, even he had these great sins against God, against uh, Bathsheba and Uriah. And we see that he even fails. And it brought a lot of unrest. And it brought the sword to his house from there on to the rest of uh, his life. And so uh, we're kind of disappointed here. And uh, as you kind of get into First and Second Kings, there's, a, there's an emphasis on how these kings of both Israel, the northern tribe, or northern kingdom, and Judah, the southern kingdom, how all of their kings ultimately don't measure up to, to being the savior that's going to really help the people. Even Solomon, who had such great prosperity, eventually had his heart turned away from God and tor turned towards other gods. So we're kind of getting a, a disappointing uh, theme going on. And, and that makes sense if you think about it being written during exile, because the reason they were in exile was because of their sins, because their leadership was corrupt and, and the people many times followed right along with those kings. And so uh, over and over, the, what First and Second Kings is trying to, to stress is this is the reason we're in exile. We're not in exile because God isn't powerful enough that he couldn't conquer the, the kings uh, or the gods of Assyria or the gods of Babylon. It was because you guys had transgressed the covenant of God, and that's why you're being punished. 
And so that's, that's really the emphasis in, in First and Second Kings is, is this is a discipline because we messed up so many times. But here when we get into Chronicles, it's a little bit different take. And a lot of the, the negative details are, are taken out. And there's a, kind of a highlight of the good kings of Judah. Uh, there is no, uh, not a lot of mention about the, the sin of David with Bathsheba and with, um, with Uriah. And so they're, they're kind of focusing on the, the positive parts, which, which does make sense if you, if you see that it was written right as they got back from exile. Because when they got back from exile, the temple was gone. They didn't have any walls to protect them. The, city of Jerusalem was just in shambles, and, and, and they needed hope. They needed to revive their hope and what, what God was going to do among them. And so here in Chronicles is a, a connection from, from what had happened and what God had promised before to what God was going to do in the future for them. So there is a lot of hope in these books, and, and uh, there are times where in our lives we need to really repent and, and, and turn to God uh, in fasting and, and, and in weeping for what we've done and, and to understand some of the things that are happening in our life are, are a discipline because of our sin. But there's also a time where we need, after we've repented, we need to set our hopes on God and remember his promises and to, to have assurance in our salvation. And that's kind of what Chronicles is doing. It's trying to give them assurance that, that what God promised long ago to David and, and to even Abraham is going to be fulfilled among you in the future. That there was still hope in the future. And you'll notice even there at, uh, at the beginning of First Chronicles that it starts with Adam. What a great name. Don't you agree, Adam Warren, back there? Great name. It starts with Adam, and then it ends there uh, in Second Chronicles. In uh, Second Chronicles uh, 36, it ends with them returning from the exile. So this is a pretty good summary of all the history of God's people uh, in the Old Testament. And so first you have all these genealogies and this was part of my daily Bible reading this last week and boy I had like three or four days of it and it was just like oh I'm so tired of this. But but just understand the chronicles uh, where it gets its names the, these chronicles these genealogies were connecting the, the people that returned from exile with all the promises in the, the other part of the Old Testament, the, the, the promises given to God's people before. So that, that's the connection. That's why it was important for God to put this in uh, a, a part of the Scripture, is that it was connecting them to the promises of God that God had made uh, through his people long ago. And uh, we actually see one of those promises uh, revived here, or at least um, reiterated in 1 Chronicles 17, as we see uh, the covenant with David uh, mentioned also in this book. Uh, 1 Chronicles uh, chapter 17. David wanted to build God a house, but God came back and says, no, you're not going to build the house. You're a wartime king, but I will build you a house. In other words, I'm going to buy, build you a dynasty. And so uh, this is what he says, starting in verse 7. Now therefore, thus shall you say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, to be a prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you have gone, and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make for you a name like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel and plant them, and they may dwell in your own place and be disturbed no more. And violent men shall waste, uh, waste them no more as formerly from the time I appointed judges over my people Israel, and I will subdue, subdue all your enemies. Moreover, I will declare to you that the Lord will build you a house when your days are filled to walk with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, one of your own sons, and I will establish his kingdom. And he shall build a house for me, and I will establish his throne forever. And I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. I will not take my steadfast love from him, as I took it from him who was before you. But I will confirm him in my house 
and in my kingdom forever, and his throne shall be established forever. Okay, so here we see again this promise of God. We read it last week from, from 2 Samuel 7, this covenant with David. But in that covenant with David in 2 Samuel, there's a highlight of how God was going to discipline David's son after he turned away from him, after he had sinned. And so we were reading that and we said, oh, that's talking about Solomon, right? And that's what happened to Solomon. And it, it really divided the kingdom because of Solomon's uh, kind of dividing of allegiance between God and the gods of the land. And so here we don't get that emphasis on the negative. There's no mention of discipline. And really, since we know this was written after the exile, we can really see why there's this great emphasis here on establishing his throne forever, establishing his house forever. Uh, verse 14, I will confirm him in my house and in my kingdom forever. His throne shall be established forever. It, it's, it's linking the people of, of, of the Jews to this covenant and that God was going to still fulfill this covenant even though they had been in exile. And so there is this hope that's kind of created that the descendants of, of David were still going to have a positive effect on the people of God. And obviously we see the connection with Jesus because not only was he from the line of David and he was viewed as the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant, but also we know that Jesus called himself the temple, right? In three days I'll destroy this temple and, and raise it back up. He says that in John chapter 2. And so here we kind of see the, the parallel and, and the hope for a future of a, of, of a new temple that God was going to create among them with this new king that was going to be on that throne forever. So a lot of hope is, is here being kind of infused with David. We also see this hope a little bit later in the book in, in 1 Chronicles 28. 1 Chronicles 28. Now, in 2 Saul, uh, 2nd, no, 1 Kings. No, hold on. I had my coffee this morning. I should be good on this. In 2 Kings 7, we saw that God told him, I'm not going to allow you to build my house. But uh, we didn't get any other details other than that. Uh, but in 1 Chronicles 28, we see that there is um, some things that David did to kind of prepare uh, Solomon and kind of set him up to build this new house uh, for the Lord. Uh, let's look there, 28 verses 11. Uh, Verses 11 through 19. Then David gave Solomon his son the plan of the vestibule of the temple and of its houses, its treasuries, its upper rooms, its inner chambers, and of the room for the mercy seat and the plan of all that he had in mind for the courts of the house of the Lord, all the surrounding chambers, the treasuries of the house of God, and the treasuries for the dedicated gifts, for the divisions of the priests and of the Levites and all the work of the the service in the house of the Lord, for all the vessels for the service in the house of the Lord, the weight of the gold for all the golden vessels for each service, the weight of silver vessels for each service, the weight of golden lamps and their uh, lampstands and their lamps, the weight of the gold. Okay, it keeps going on. You're like, man, this is a lot of details. Did we really need all of these details in the scripture? But well, let's keep going. Verse. Um, uh, verse 19, all this he made clear to me in writing from the hand of the Lord, all the work to be done according to the plan. And so here David is, is kind of giving the blueprint to Solomon. This is how you're going to build the house. This is even down to how much gold you need to put in certain places and, and in the lampstands and the silvers and all, all that stuff. So he, he kind of gives us a map of all this, and he hands it off to Solomon. But did David come up with this all on his own? Okay, I see a no. All right, where did he get it? He got it from God, right? Yeah, according to the plan, verse 19, all he made clear to me in writing from the hand of Jehovah, from Yahweh. And so here God was the one who gave David the plans um, to, to build the temple. 
which kind of reminds us of what happened back in the book of Exodus. If you remember, there's these really long narratives that make daily Bible reading really boring at times of all the little details that were supposed to be put into the tabernacle. Now, who, who did God give that, uh, all those instructions to about the tabernacle? I heard it. Say it louder. I thought I heard it. Moses. Moses right. Good. And so here, in, in, in a sense, David is seen as the new Moses. He's, he's kind of giving the instructions for the house of God. And so it almost seems like there's, again, a, a little bit more hope about the future as we look at, at David and, and, and saying there's going to be a new David. Here's a new Moses, a new lawgiver. And so it may be among the Jewish people at a time, uh, returned from exile, they're thinking, man, there's a lot of hope here. Um, and there's a lot of hope, especially as they were building uh, a new temple among themselves as well. All right, so um, here again we find David giving the instructions for Solomon to build the house. Now let's turn to Second Chronicles, Second Chronicles, and turn to uh, chapter 7. We're going to see the completion of this house that was um, planned by God uh, for a place for God to dwell among his people in a, uh, in a, per, a permanent, uh, somewhat permanent, I guess, eventually it gets destroyed, but a permanent structure instead of a, uh, uh, one you could tear down like the tabernacle. So Second Chronicles uh, chapter 7, um, this is kind of the inauguration of, of the temple after it's done. Uh, by Solomon. Uh, starting verse 11, thus Solomon finished the house of the Lord and the king's house, all that Solomon had planned to do in the house of the Lord and in his own house he successfully accomplished. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon in the night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. So God's saying, you know, thank you for what you've done. I accept the gift. Um, verse 13, when I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command the locusts to devour the land or send pestilence among my people, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to their prayer that is made in this place. All right, let's pause. We, we hear this verse a lot. Um, 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves, pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear their prayer from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. We especially heard it a lot with the, the pandemic here recently. Um, who, who are my people according to the context? Okay, so Israel, um, this is uh, still in the time of the United Kingdom. And so this would be all of Israel. And what was, um, why, why would they decide that they needed to turn to God and repent? They were punishing him. Punishing them for what? Yeah, it, it doesn't say here explicitly. But yeah, it's, it's, they're not obeying the covenant. In fact, if you were to look in Deuteronomy 29, we see a big emphasis uh, from Moses before they go into the land. If you do not keep the covenant, this is what's going to happen to you. Okay? And some of the things that are listed here, the pestilence, the, the locusts, um, also exile is mentioned there in Deuteronomy 29. Uh, a lot of this is saying, this is what happens if you don't obey my word. If you don't keep my covenant, then you will be exiled uh, from your place. And so here, um, the connection is with the temple of God uh, being established by Solomon and, and almost God saying, hey, if, if you guys, I, I will dwell among you, but if, if, if you guys disobey my covenant, if you turn, to be out, uh, turn out to be unholy, know there's going to be consequences to this. But even if there is consequences, all you have to do is turn to me. Here he said he's going to make this place a house of sacrifice. They can sacrifice for these sins, humble themselves, turn to God, 
he will take care of all these consequences that come from disobeying the, co the covenant and that you will have a, a, uh, a, a wonderful place to live here in the land, in the land of Canaan. All right, so the issue a lot of times with this uh, verse when it's quoted in our day and time is a lot of times people will uh, take it out of context and not realize that it was uh, attached to the covenant. And the covenant that we have with Christ we don't get promises that, that everything's going to be great all the time. Uh, we don't get the promises that, that we won't suffer. We don't get the prom. I mean, even Christians suffer at the hand of locusts and pestilence uh, in our day and time. Um, and so our covenant is different than the one in the old covenant. And so therefore, uh, certainly in our covenant, we need humility. Uh, we need to turn from our wicked ways. Uh, we need to speak to God, who is in heaven, but we have no promise that, that we're going to be healed physically uh, because, of, um, because of our repentance. In fact, many times, uh, even despite our relationship with God, and we've seen this among our church family, that a lot of people who are the most faithful people to God have illnesses, have difficulties, have tragedies, have losses in their lives. And so... I just want to encourage us to keep this verse in context and, and understand that this is, not a, this is not a prescription of how America overcomes the pandemic, okay? Now, certainly, if we as God's people, the church today, humble ourselves, that it could lead to the healing of people's souls, that they can find healing with God. And, and certainly, when we have that relationship with God, we have power in our prayer to ask Him for healing, but just because we turn to God doesn't mean that the pandemic is going to be over, okay? So, any comments on that? Make sense? All right. So Jesus is our ultimate example, right? That he suffered even to the point of death. He died um, out of faithfulness to God. And, uh, and certainly um, we join him in our sufferings in this life as we are his disciples. We follow after him. Therefore, if the world hated him, the world's going to hate us too. And so we, uh, we actually have a promise of suffering. You know, that uh, if you live a godly life, I think this is 2 Timothy. Uh, Paul says that, that you're going to endure persecution. And so, uh, and that's just a little bit of it. I mean, obviously there's more with illnesses and uh, financial troubles and, and relationship troubles and, and the list could go on. Um, God doesn't promise us a perfect life in, in, uh, in Christ, but that our life will be perfected in him, that we will grow and mature so that we can endure whatever comes our way. So, all right. Let's go to Second Chronicles. Chapter 34. So we get some good kings, um, both in in First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles. We see some good kings. We listed a few last week. I kind of uh, <laughs> blanked out too. Um, but we talked about uh, Josiah, we talked about Hezekiah, David, uh, Jehoshaphat, Asa. Uh, there's some that were a little mixed, like uh, Joash. Um, so there were some good kings of, of Judah. Israel, after the split, they didn't have any good kings. Uh, but here, in 2 Chronicles 34, we read about a good king, Josiah. He's the great reformer. Uh, he finds the book of the law in the temple, and he reads it. He repents. He, he tries to turn uh, the nation back to God, and he, he destroyed all the, the gods in the land. It's, it's an amazing... Uh, uh, an amazing example of the leadership um, because you, you know that people had to be angry when he was destroying their gods, their shrines, their high places. Uh, but he was going to do what was right no matter uh, what people said. And so here in uh, 2 Chronicles 34, he, he had uh, turned, God back, uh, turned Israel back to God, uh, excuse me, Judah, the southern kingdom. He turned them back to God. However, just because they turned back to God, we see that there was still 
um, there were still consequences of sin to be had. Look at verse 21, uh, 2 Chronicles 34, verse 21. Just go inquire of the Lord for me and for those who are left in Israel and in Judah concerning the words of this book has been found. For great is the wrath of God that is poured out on us because our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord to do according to what is written in this book. So he, he realized that God's wrath had been kind of adding up against the people, and, and he wanted them to go and uh, inquire. Unfortunately, um, it, was, um, it was too late, and there was still going to be disaster. Um, look at verse 24. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will bring disaster upon this place, upon its inhabitants, all the curses that are written the book that was read before the king of Judah, because they have forsaken me, they have made offerings to other gods, they, that they might provoke me to anger with all the works of their hands. Therefore, my wrath will be poured out on this place and will not be quenched. Uh, in Second Kings, the emphasis is really on the sin of Manasseh. Uh, Manasseh, his, uh, his sins were so egregious that it, it just kind of set the, um, the train on those tracks to head off the cliff, okay? Uh, and so there was no turning back after that point. And so that's, that's kind of how uh, it is. No matter how faithful uh, Josiah was and uh, the fact that, that he kept the Passover and did all these things uh, for the, the people of Israel, uh, the people of Judah, excuse me, um, they still were going to go into exile. Uh, there was no turning back at that point. And, and we kind of see that in our day-to-day -day lives. You know, if someone uh, commits a crime they go to the prison, and they might get, they might seek a relationship with God. They might seek God's forgiveness for that, but they still have to finish the sentence. And uh, that's kind of how it is here with uh, with the people of Judah. Uh, look towards the end. I mentioned uh, that it, it mentions the uh, the destruction of Jerusalem here, and that how they were exiled uh, into Babylon. That's verses 17 through 21. Then in 22, it, it, it speaks about the return from exile with Cyrus the Great. Uh, verse 22, this is 2 Chronicles 36, 22. And on the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, the, the king of Persia. So he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put into writing. Thus says king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever is among you, all of his people, may uh, the Lord, his God, be with him. Let him go up. And so it kind of ends on a hopeful note. You know, we're going back to the homeland. We're going to build a house. God is, is still working through human history. He's working through this pagan king called Cyrus. Uh, it's interesting, even in the scripture uh, of Isaiah, I think it's Isaiah 42, I might be wrong on that, maybe 45, but it actually calls Cyrus the anointed one, which in Hebrew and in Greek, the anointed one is the word Messiah or Christ, which is really weird to hear from a pagan king um, that he would be called the Messiah. Um, but I think Dennis did a wonderful job on this uh, maybe two Wednesday nights ago to speak about Cyrus and how God sometimes uses these pagan kings for a certain purpose. And that's really what it means to be the anointed one, is that he had a certain purpose for this person. Just like with Jesus, he was anointed for the purpose to come and seek and save the lost, to come and, and to die for our sins, to be a ransom for many. And so here they are able to come back into the land through Cyrus. Uh, to me, it's interesting how these superpowers, uh, these big empires, are being used by God for his purposes. Uh, we have Assyria, and how Assyria came and destroyed um, the northern tribe, uh, the northern kingdom of Israel. And they, they had a theory. Their, their way of conquering people was to exile some of them but also bring other people in the land to kind of intermix so that they didn't really have a strong nationality to rebel against the king of Syria. Then you have the Babylonians, which had a different approach, and they pretty much just exiled everyone except the very, very poor. And so that, that's what happened with Nebuchadnezzar. They just exiled them 
And he actually used a lot of them in their government. We see that with, with uh, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that they were, they were trained in order to be high in the government over there uh, in Babylonia. And then you have uh, the Persians, which is a, diff a whole different uh, philosophy completely, is that they, he returned the exiles, not just with Judah, but other places, and he allowed them to practice their own religion there. Um, you remember Nebuchadnezzar tried to force his religion on the people by having this golden statue, and every time the music played, they were to bow down to it, or else they'd be thrown into the ferny, fi uh, fiery furnace. Um, well, with, with Cyrus, he just kind of let them have their own worship and kind of use that as a way to uh, make sure the people didn't rebel. So there's just different philosophies with these different kingdoms that come and uh, deal with the, the people of Judah. And, and certainly we see this even further with the Greeks that will eventually rule over uh, the people of Judah. Uh, we don't see that very much in the Old Testament. It's kind of in that 400 years between the Old Testament and the New, New Testament. Uh, but ultimately we'll see that again with Rome, how they kind of did some things different as well. But God's using all these powers to, to, uh, to further his purposes, uh, to judge his people, and then also a lot of times to judge the kingdoms that judge his people. Uh, we see that with Assyria. They came and destroyed Israel, and they, they destroyed a lot of uh, towns in Judah. Well, then the Babylonians come, and they destroy the Assyrians because they were, were too brutal. And then they had the Persians that come, and they, the Persians and the Medes, and they come and they destroy Babylonia. And, and eventually that happens with, with uh, the Persians, too, with the Greeks coming and taking over. So it's just interesting to see how God uh, works through human history, through these, these great empires of the world. And it makes us maybe think ourselves, how is God working through the world right now? As uh, you know, we live in you know, one of the superpowers in the world. And, and how, um, how is God using us in our situation with uh, really our prosperity and our our affluence and our, our good quality of life here in America, how is he using that to further his, his purposes in the world? That's something to consider and uh, kind of sets us up for the, the sermon this morning as we think about how do we use our riches uh, to, to uh, use them in service to God and to other people. All right, so that's the end of Second Chronicles. Any thoughts before we move on to Ezra? not. Ezra is part of some of the exiles coming back. Now, he's not actually found until uh, the seventh chapter of the book, uh, and he doesn't return until that point in time. And actually, there is a, a time gap, a time gap between Ezra 6 and Ezra 7 of about 58 years. So this was uh, kind of, a, it stretches out a lot of history. Uh, the first one, uh, the first group returns uh, after about 67 years in exile. And then there is about 81 years until the second group comes, and that's the group with Ezra. And there's even more time until uh, Nehemiah comes back. Okay, So that's kind of the chronology. They came in three different ways. Now the first wave was the, the largest one. It was led by Zerubbabel and Yeshua, or Jeshua, Joshua, whatever you want to say it. Some, some translations, I'm, I'm kind of surprised. Uh, some of them say Joshua. Some of them say uh, Jeshua. Uh, just interesting. It's the same word. It's the same word used for, uh, you know, the Joshua, the, the, the leader of the conquest back in the book of, of, um, of Joshua. So uh, they returned home. Their mission was to rebuild the temple. That was their first priority. Look there in Ezra 1. Verses 2 and 3, that says, Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in, in Judah. Whoever is among all of his people may be his God, uh, excuse me, may his God be with him, and let them go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, to rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. So, I think, especially the language there, it shows us that that certainly Cyrus had an encounter with Jehovah, with Yahweh, the God of Israel, the God of Judah. Uh, but uh, it doesn't seem like he's really like pledging his full allegiance to him. Uh, notice it says that 
uh, towards the end of verse 3, he is the God who is in Jerusalem. So a lot of, a lot of the uh, people that time, they believed in like a God of locality. Like, uh, you know, the people of Canaan, they served one God. The people of Judah, they served another God. The people of Egypt, they served another. And so they kind of had, um, they kind of had almost like a national God. And even further, a lot of the, the clans, uh, the families in these areas would often have their own family gods, too. You kind of see that with, with Jacob when uh, he's escaping Laban, that he kind of brings the household gods with him. Actually, I think Rachel did, and she sat on it so that uh, he, he didn't uh, know where those gods were. Um, and so for them, it, when they think about you know, the God of Israel, it's kind of like, yeah, we respect that God over there. We're still going to serve our God over here, but we respect that that is a deity over there. It's kind of like when you go to India, and maybe Lil can speak to this a little bit. You have to be very clear that Jesus is the only way. Because sometimes they'll just say, oh, Jesus sounds like a great guy, you know, powerful uh, uh, in, in word and deed, does all these wonders and signs. We'll just add him to our shelf of gods that we have. And so you have to be very care careful to say, you know, this is exclusively the only way to the Father. So uh, that's kind of the, the situation at that time. And so we shouldn't view Cyrus as the one that's like really a, a follower of Yahweh, but instead uh, just kind of added him to his, his, uh, his acknowledgement of, of that place, of uh, the place of Jerusalem. All right, so he sends them back. Uh, chapter 3. In verse 2, we read about these, um, these people who are leading the people of Israel, uh, people of Judah, excuse me. There's kind of a switch, and I'm not always good to remember the switch, but before exile, they're called Judah. When they come back from exile, they're called Jews or Jewish. Okay, there's kind of like a, a marker. That's the marker in time where they change that, that terminology. So I'm not really sure why something to look up but yeah there's kind of a, a change there uh, verse 2 then arose Jeshua the son of Jehozak with his fellow priests and Zerubbabel the son of Shittiel with his kinsmen and they built the altar of God of Israel to burn uh, to offer burnt offerings on it as it is written in the law of Moses the man of God and so here they build the altar and then they further Later on, chapter 3, start building the temple. Now, they get discouraged because the people of the land uh, paddle-tail on them. And uh, so it kind of stops the construction for a little bit. Uh, eventually, they get permission again. Um, but that's where we see these two prophets kind of come into uh, the, the mix. And it's the prophets of Zechariah and Haggai. See that in chapter 5. Verses 1 and 2, the prophets Haggai and Zechariah, the son of Iddo, prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah and Jerusalem in the, in the name of God of Israel who was over them. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shittiel, and Yeshua, the son of Jehozak, arose and began to rebuild the house of God that is in Jerusalem. And the prophets of God were with them, supporting them. So it took the prophets to kind of say, okay, we've got to get this together. You know, I know you were discouraged for a little bit of time. But we need to kick this into gear and make sure that we restore uh, this temple. We rebuild this temple. And, and that's, what, uh, that's what they did. All right, so that's the first half of Ezra. The second half of Ezra is uh, when Ezra comes back. He comes with uh, significantly less people. first wave was about 50,000 people. Ezra comes back uh, with 2,000 people. And his mission was really to teach the law of God. Uh, look at chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. From the first day of the first month, he began to go up from Babylonia. On the first day of the fifth month, he came to Jerusalem for the good, uh, for the good hand of his God was with him. So God is, is again working through his providence. Verse 10, for Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach his statutes and rules in Israel. And so that's kind of his emphasis is uh, they rebuilt the temple. Now he is going to rebuild for them an understanding of God's law. And part of that was that they had uh, sinned. Uh, they had intermarried with the people of the land. And so in chapter 10, 
and verse 3. He says uh, to the people, we have, we have broken faith with our God and have married foreign women from peoples of this land. But even now, there's hope for Israel in spite of this. And so he calls them to repentance, and they separated from their, their wives, and they were able to um, get back on track of, uh, of trying to follow the word of the Lord. Now, in our last three minutes, let's look at Nehemiah. Nehemiah was uh, the cupbearer. Dennis did a good job explaining uh, how dangerous his job was as the cupbearer, um, being kind of the taste tester for the king. Uh, but it was a high position, a, one of a trustworthy uh, position. And, and because of, of hearing what was going on in, in, um, back in the land, he was concerned and uh, that, that Jerusalem was, was under threat, that their, their gates had been destroyed, there was nothing protecting the temple of God. We see that he asked to go back home, and that's what he did. Now, there certainly were was uh, discouragement. Um, there are two characters, Sanballat of Samaria and Tobiah the Ammonite, that really gave them a lot of trouble, uh, and it caused them to have to to build the wall and be prepared to fight at the same time. Look at chapter four. Verses 16 through 18. From that day on, half of my servants worked on construction, half held spears, shields, bows, and coats of mail. And the people and the leaders stood behind the whole house of Judah, who were building the wall. Those who carried burdens were loaded in such a way that each laborer on his work with one hand and held his weapon with the other. Think about how hard that would be. Be prepared to fight, but also be building at the same time. Uh, but there was a determination among the people of God to do the work. And we find in uh, chapter 6 that they completed the wall in 52 days, which was a, a quite uh, an accomplishment. It's in verses uh, 15 and 16. So the wall was finished on the 25th day of the, the month of Elul uh, in 52 days. And when all our enemies heard of it, all the nations around us were afraid and greatly uh, fell greatly in their own esteem, for they perceived that, the, that this work had been accomplished with the help of our God. So again, God's providence in helping uh, them get back to the city of God and to have protection all around. Um, there was further, uh, you know, Ezra is a part of this, um, uh, this book as well, starting in chapter 8, and how he uh, tries to reestablish some of the festivals and, and to read the book of the law. It's, it's quite moving. We, we read it a couple Wednesday nights ago, but uh, now God's people are back in the land. They're more hopeful of the future, and that's really going to lead us into the New Testament because we'll find the Jewish people with a lot of hopes, a lot of expectations, specifically of a new Messiah, a new anointed one, a new Davidic king, and a new temple. Okay, So they'll, they'll have these, some of these hopes kind of running through their veins as we get into uh, the New Testament. So just keep that in mind. We'll, we'll cover Esther next week and then get into the, um, the five books of, of poetry. We probably won't get done with this before the end of the quarter at the end of the month. Um, but I, I hope to get at least through the Old Testament by the end of the month, and then we'll do the New Testament for a few Sundays into, uh, into the, the month of June. So, and, and I think we'll have Fred Rhodes come and speak to us sometime in there that will uh, also... Uh, be part of the Bible class. I think it's on the 23rd. So things to look forward to. Uh, but uh, yeah, if you want to go ahead and kind of do a survey of, of Esther and then the, the five books of uh, poetry, they're called the writings in, uh, in Hebrew. Uh, if you want to go ahead and look at that, that's what we'll be covering next week. So, all right, I think it's time. He was waiting for me. Allow me to finish my sentence. I appreciate that. Kenny has no regard for that.